Hey everyone, it's Kendall from the Recording Lounge Podcast, and on today's episode, I wanted to take a look at high-pass filters, and I wanted to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to high-pass filters. Now, high-pass filters are something that we use all the time in pro audio, and it's something that I think a lot of people abuse in the wrong ways, and I'm going to try to help you understand why I think people use them too much, and also where they're most effective and where they're not that effective. So let's go for it. So first things first, for anyone out there who's maybe new to audio and you're not exactly sure what I'm talking about, a high-pass filter is simply a device or a circuit or a plug-in that's designed to allow high frequencies to pass while low frequencies are cut or sent to ground. Now, in other terms, you could just call this a low-cut filter, but technically the proper term is a high-pass filter. And similarly, a low-pass filter is the same the other direction. So uh, low frequencies are allowed to pass while high frequencies are cut. So low-pass allows the lows to pass. A high-pass allows the highs to pass. Now, you'll hear pros even mess up this terminology from time to time. It's an easy thing to mess up because typically when we're talking about a piece of gear, we're talking about what it affects, right? So like a high shelf affects the highs, right? But a high pass actually doesn't touch the highs, it affects the lows. So it's an easy mistake to make. Just know that the correct terminology is high pass filters allow the highs to pass and cut low end. Now, high-pass filters have been around for a long time. They go back to some of the earliest circuitry that we even have for audio devices, early speaker systems, early radios, things like that. And high-pass filters were used for a lot of different purposes, but originally they were rarely used for actual tonal shaping purposes. They were more used for filtering out completely unnecessary information, for blocking DC, for filtering out things below the audible spectrum that would potentially interfere with the circuitry of the amp. Similarly, low-pass filters were often implemented to cut off high frequencies that could possibly interfere with the amp. For example, if you're designing a TV speaker or a PA system and you want to make sure that radio frequencies don't get involved, radio frequencies are very high frequency, right? We're talking in the megahertz, gigahertz, and if you put in a low-pass filter at, let's say, 30 kilohertz, then theoretically, no radio signals could get into your amplifier because what whatever might be there would be completely filtered out, right? So originally these circuits, at least in my opinion, were not designed for tone shaping. They were designed for removing completely unnecessary information. Now, as I've done audio longer, I actually feel that this is the proper way to use a high-pass filter, but we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. So why do we use high-pass filters so often in the pro audio domain? Well, they serve a couple different functions and they're all very useful. We can use them to clean up low frequency rumble from air conditioners or from cars passing or just general room rumble that exists for whatever reason. We can use them to clear space in our low end. For example, if we've got a mix with guitars and vocals and keyboards and we really don't have a lot of important information down below, let's say 100 hertz, we can high pass filter basically everything except our kick and bass and they have a very clear low end to occupy now as opposed to just cluttering it up with little bits of information that aren't even useful to the other instruments. We can also use them creatively to accentuate a low frequency. If we use a high-pass filter with a resonant peak, uh, something that goes above the zero line, we can actually use it to sort of force the low frequencies into that resonant peak and then block what is going below that resonant peak. This can be really useful on things like kick drum or toms. We can use a high-pass filter to help offset proximity effect from microphones, particularly if we're using them in 6 dB per octave slopes. They're really nice at offsetting the proximity effect from a microphone, which also tends to build up around 6 dB per octave. And we can just use them as a tonal shaping tool to give something less low end in general. Now, for the most part, high-pass filters are going to have one, two, or three controls that we can adjust. 
The first is our frequency, and we call this our corner frequency. Now, something a lot of people confuse about this corner frequency is that it's actually about 3 dB down at this point. So when a filter says 70 hertz, it's not zero at 70 hertz, and it starts filtering there. It actually starts filtering a little bit higher, and 70 hertz is your 3 dB down point. Now, the next control we might see is the slope, and the slope is basically telling us how many dB per octave is this rolling off. So, for example, if we have a high-pass filter set to 100 hertz with a 6 dB per octave slope, that means that by 50 hertz, we will be about minus 6 dB down. Now, it doesn't exactly work out this way mathematically for every single type of filter. It does depend on the exact type of filter shape, and it depends on the cue of the filter. But I'm not going to get into the math here. Just suffice it to say that about an octave down will be equivalent to your slope. So a 12 dB per octave slope at 100 hertz would be 12 dB down at 50 hertz. 18 dB per octave would be 18 dB down at 50 hertz, and so on. It's a loose estimate. Now, the other control you might see on a high-pass filter would be Q, and Q in a parametric equalizer stands for quality, so typically what that means is a higher quality filter will be a narrower bandwidth that will be a more precise filter, right? But when it comes to high-pass filters and low-pass filters, the Q generally adjusts our resonance at the corner frequency, so it will add a little bit of a bump above zero as you turn that Q higher. If you open up something like FabFilter Pro Q3, you can see this in action. Change to something like 12 or 18 dB per octave, and then play with your Q control, and you will see this added corner resonance. Now, if you have a Q of about 1.4, somewhere in that region, instead of having your corner frequency be minus 3 dB down, it will actually be about zero. So you can play with that a little bit. If you don't want your corner frequency to actually be minus 3 dB down, you can set your Q to something like 1.4, somewhere around there, and it will make that about zero. But you will have a little bit of a resonance bump above that. So now that you understand the basics of what a high-pass filter is and what it does and how the controls work, I think it leads us to an even more interesting discussion, which is, okay, we know that we can use a high-pass filter to clean up low-end and create space and remove unnecessary energy, but to me, the better question is, why is that stuff down there in the first place, right? Like, why do we have so much low-end on everything? And is there anything we can do to prevent having that much low end on everything? Well, I think it comes down to four or five primary reasons why everything seems to have a ton of low end and why high pass filters have become an essential tool in the modern audio engineers toolkit. So the first reason is something that we've talked about on the podcast before, which is the idea that every instrument has the capacity to be a solo instrument. And while that is a little bit of a pain for a full mix, that is a good thing in the grand scheme, right? Like we want a piano or an acoustic guitar or an electric guitar to have the capacity to sound good and full by itself. If we were recording, say, a solo classical piece on piano, we wouldn't want it to sound super super thin and small and wimpy. We would want it to fill up the majority of the frequency spectrum. We'd want it to present itself in a balanced way to our ears. But of course, we put that exact same piano recording in the context of a band with drums and vocals and guitars, and it probably has way too much low end. So I think some of it is just the nature of the beast, that instruments in general have a lot of low end capacity. I mean, a piano can go down to 20, 30, 40 hertz in a lot of cases, and that's natural from the instrument. So some of it is just the nature of the beast. Now, another reason why I think sources tend to have a lot of low-end buildup is because, especially in the last 30 years, it's become more trendy to mic things close. We like the isolation, we like the clarity, we like the definition from micing something close, and when we use directional microphones, we're going to get proximity effect. And that's just something that we're going to have to accept, is that if we want the clarity and the intimacy and the isolation of micing something close, we will get an increase increase in proximity effect. The only way we could really avoid this is if we were using only omnidirectional microphones in rooms that were highly treated so that we wouldn't get too much room sound in our direct mic. 
Now, on that note, I think another big change that's happened in the industry, especially in the last 30 years or so, is the rise in smaller studios or project studios or home studios. For many, many years, sort of the only way you could record was with professional equipment in professionally designed and treated rooms. Now, of course, there are anomalies to this, Motown and so on. But in general, most pro studios were really, really well designed, intended for music recording. They were also typically large enough to handle a live band because you had to record things live for much of the industry's history. Now, of course, as time went on, studios got a little smaller, things moved more to booths and smaller rooms, especially in the 70s and 80s. And things have changed a lot in that regard. And a home studio, especially a bedroom-sized room, ironically, Ironically, has typically more low-end buildup than a large room, not only because the walls are closer to you, but because the dimensions are such that the earliest, lowest fundamental modes that happen in that room are at a higher frequency. If you're in a small room with an eight-foot ceiling, you're probably going to have a resonance around 70 hertz because of that ceiling dimension. But if you're in a large commercial facility that has a 20-foot ceiling, that's going to be more like 28 hertz. So the strongest modes in that room are so low that it actually is less of a problem because by the time you get up to the 50, 60, 70, 80 hertz region, they've lost a lot of energy because now this is the second, third, fourth, fifth mode in the room, not your fundamental mode. What I'm getting at is a lot of times small rooms have more low end problems and more low end buildup than large rooms. So even when we're close miking things, a lot of times a small room is going to sound more boomy, more unclear in your low end, and that will get into every microphone that you use. And what you're hearing, you might confuse for proximity effect, and so you back the mic up away from the source, but in fact, all you're doing is getting it closer to the room when you back it away from the source. So you're not really fixing that problem. It's something that can really only be fixed by treating your room. And as we've talked about on the podcast before, treating low end is not easy. It takes large, thick traps to really get down to low frequencies. And in many cases, you need specially designed membrane absorbers and things of that nature to actually get down to your fundamental modes. Now, this is something that professional studios often employ all around the room. And you might not see it in photos because you might just see wood slats or something like that. But very often, professionally treated rooms have multiple feet of treatment all around the room. And it's covered by slats to make sure the room doesn't get too dead. Anyway, so small rooms can be another factor in why your recordings are so boomy and have so much low end. Now, a related phenomenon is just a generally unclear low end. When we hear a source that has been recorded that has a really boomy, unclear, muddy low end, we'll naturally want to take some of that out, especially if we've been working on mixes for a while. We will hear that low end and think, oh, that doesn't sound very good, and we'll want to cut some of it. But some of it is not necessarily that the low end is too loud. It's just that it's unclear. For example, if you're recording bass guitar and and you have 10-year-old strings on it and the low end has no clarity, then you might feel like that has too much low end. But in fact, it has not enough high frequency content and it just has a general muddiness to the low end. So what we might perceive as being too bassy is actually just an unclear bass. Now, arguably one of the biggest reasons why everything seems to have too much low end now is that pieces of gear are way more full spectrum nowadays. So converters are super wide frequency response. Outboard gear is super wide frequency response. Microphones have a wider frequency response. Speakers have a wider frequency response. Everything seems to have a wider frequency response. So they can go to a lower frequency. They can pick up to a lower frequency. They can transmit to a lower frequency. I'll give you an example. One of the biggest leaps in the audio world in the last 50 years has been the improvements to speaker technology. And that applies to pro audio speakers like studio monitors, as well as guitar speakers. Now, notice how we're all still crazy about Neves and APIs and SSLs and all these great pieces of analog gear. But when it comes to speaker technology for studio monitors, it's all about the latest and greatest state-of-the-art monitoring technology like Barefoot and Proac and ATC and Amazon. 
Pantheon and all these like state of the art monitoring brands. But like I said, it's not just pro audio speakers that have improved. It's also guitar speakers. Now, if you listen to a vintage guitar speaker, a lot of them are kind of thin, at least thinner than a modern speaker. Now, for this reason, we might not have been able to hear that many vintage amps like Marshalls and Fenders and Voxes had a ton of flubby low end going on. But because the vintage speakers of the day didn't have the capability to reproduce that kind of low end and we didn't know as much about speaker technology and speaker design and cabinet design as we know now, we didn't really hear that those amps had tons of low end. But if we use a vintage amp with a modern speaker, suddenly we hear all this huge fat low end. Now, it's funny because a lot of people talk about vintage gear and vintage guitars and vintage amps as being warm and smooth and fat. But in reality, a lot of those vintage tones are kind of thin and bright. I mean, if you listen to old recordings, a lot of those guitars sound pretty thin and small and bright. But again, if you put those old rigs into a modern speaker cabinet, suddenly there's all this low end. And there's probably more top end as well. Now, some amp makers like Friedman, for example, have modified their designs to accommodate a more modern speaker. So, for example, if you look at schematics for old Marshalls versus a Friedman, which is definitely Marshall-esque, but, you know, it's quite a bit more in-depth than a Marshall circuit, you'll notice that in the Friedman, there is a conscious effort to make the low end tighter and the amp more articulate than vintage Marshalls, while still paying homage to that same type of circuit topology. So a Friedman amp works really well with a modern speaker, but a vintage Marshall might kind of sound flubby with a modern speaker. Another great example of innovation in this type of department is AEA's Nuvo series of microphones. So typically AEA is known for their big ribbon designs like the AEA R44, R88, R84, and so on. Now, in the Nuvo series, they make two microphones, the N8, which is loosely based on one side of the R88, which is basically a stereo version of the R84. Now, the N8 has that classic huge fat low end, but therein lies the problem. We don't always need or want that excess low end. That's exactly what we're talking about, right? Hence, they designed the N22. Now, this microphone is one of my favorites in my entire collection because it has that sort of classic smoothness of a ribbon, except it has way more mid-range and high-frequency clarity and presence and a much tighter bass. AEA themselves say that this microphone was intended to be used for close miking, and I think that shows a lot of smart innovation and awareness of the way that we make records now. AEA is not just trying to recreate the same thing over and over again, but instead they're saying, what do people need? How do we make records now? How can I make a ribbon mic that works for the way that we make records in modern day? And the N22 is a perfect example of that. And I wish more microphone manufacturers would jump on that train and say, hey, we know people are going to be miking things close. We know people are working in smaller rooms. We don't need to keep making copies of U47s that people used to mic three feet away from things. We need to make microphones that sound good and balanced when you mic things close. Anyway, so all of these things are examples of why our recordings seem to just naturally have a ton of low end and why we're so often reaching for high pass filters to solve that problem. So are we just bound to the high pass filter forever? Is that the only solution that we really have to these problems? Well, no. And in fact, I think the high pass filter is often not the solution people are actually looking for. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So the first thing to consider is the source that you're actually recording versus the filter that you're trying to use to fix the problems, right? Very often, the problem starts at the source with mic technique. For example, if you've ever mic'd up an acoustic guitar at the sound hole, you'll know that it's really boomy, and it's not something that can really be fixed by a high-pass filter or a shelf. It's just a boomy sound no matter what you do. The real solution there is not to use a high-pass filter, it's to mic it up differently. It's one of the reasons why we mic up at the 12th fret or the neck joint rather than right in front of the sound hole. Because the sound source itself, the thing you're actually recording is basically going to be boomy no matter what filtering you do. And this is not something you can really fix with a shelf either. It's just a boomy sounding capture. And all you can really do is turn those frequencies up or down. You can't change the relationship of frequencies. If you want to change the relationship of frequencies, you either need to use a different source or a different mic technique. 
Now, another example of this is miking up a bass amp. One of my favorite ways to mic up a bass amp is with an Omni mic up close. Typically, when you use an Omni microphone, it goes down to a very low frequency and it doesn't have any proximity effect. So if you put a baffle in front of your bass amp, you can put an omnidirectional condenser right up on that bass cabinet and you won't get that drastic increase of low end. And because of the baffle, you won't get too much room sound. So that's one way you can adjust your mic technique to not have an excessive low end right off the bat. Now, if you're recording electric guitar and we're using microphones that typically tend to be directional, like SM57s or bi-directional, like a ribbon microphone, well, you can still reduce your proximity effect by pulling the mic off of the cabinet just a little bit. Now, typically the grill of the guitar amp is actually about two inches away from the speaker itself. So if you really want to reduce the proximity effect, you probably need to move the microphone to about two inches away. If you move it to an inch away, you might get a little bit less low end, but to really notice it, you're probably gonna need it about two or three inches back instead. Now, this still pretty much sounds the same as miking directly on, except it has less low end. It doesn't drastically change the close sound, maybe a little bit, but it still pretty much sounds like miking it close. And again, if you get a little bit too much room, you can put a baffle behind the microphone. Now, another interesting question that I've gotten before is, should I use the high-pass filter on my preamp or the high-pass filter on my microphone? A lot of microphones have built-in high-pass filter options. And personally, when it's available, I like the high-pass filter on the microphone because if you cut the low end before it gets to the mic pre, you have less of a chance of getting excessive distortion or harmonic content generated from your low frequencies hitting that mic preamp. Versus adding a high-pass filter after your mic preamp, you might actually be distorting your mic preamp a little bit in the low end and getting some low frequency coloration. And that's not the same thing as cutting it before it even gets to the mic preamp, right? Now, of course, if you want the coloration from hitting the mic preamp with a lot of low end, then do it. But if you want a cleaner, clearer low end, I recommend using the high-pass filter on the microphone itself. This also protects you a little bit from distortion within the microphone circuit, either from transistors or from the output transformer overloading. Another thing that's really important to understand is that the way sound sources produce this low frequency pressure, whether it's a vocal or a guitar amp speaker or the hole on a kick drum, you can get massive low frequency thumps from those things that can affect your microphone and get you these weird pulses down at 20, 30, 40 hertz, even if your vocalist, for example, is not actually singing 20 hertz. Because of the air movement, you can get these vibrations happening. So it's really important important to use a good quality pop filter in front of a vocalist. And if you need to use two pop filters, you really want to limit the amount of air pressure that's actually hitting the microphone if you're trying to contain how much low end it's actually getting. Again, these low frequency pops are not something that can always be fixed by a high pass filter or by a shelf. I've gotten some of them on my voiceover today doing this podcast, and I can tell you it doesn't really fix it to just put a high pass filter on because if you get a thump at 20 hertz that distorts your mic preamp a little bit, you're going to get harmonics at 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, right? So it affects everything. It's not just some isolated incident down at 20 hertz. It's also important to understand that proximity effect starts way higher than you probably think. A lot of people think proximity effect is, oh, you know, 200 hertz and below. But in reality, proximity effect is this very wide tilt. And it can start as high as 500, 600 hertz and go all the way down to 20 hertz. So no matter what you're miking up, a tom, a vocal, a guitar amp, an acoustic, proximity effect can be incredibly powerful. So just be aware that a 100 hertz high pass filter or a 200 hertz high pass filter is probably not actually counteracting proximity effect in the way that you think. So for example, say you're recording an acoustic guitar and because of proximity effect, let's say it starts at 600 hertz and it goes all the way down to 20 hertz. So imagine this big gradual slope upward towards 20 hertz. If you put a high pass filter on at say 100 hertz, what you're actually left with is sort of this weird bump, this triangular sort of shape because your signal was going upward towards 20 hertz and you filtered it at 100. So you'll also find yourself having too much 200 and 300 and 400, right? 
right? Because you've left that bump in the middle. What you probably should have done is recorded the acoustic guitar a little bit farther away to counteract some of that proximity effect naturally. And if you're trying to counter it with EQ, you probably should have used a very wide shelf to handle that. Now, proximity effect does tend to build up at about 6 dB per octave, so if you're going to use a high-pass filter to counteract proximity effect, I would recommend a higher frequency but 6 dB per octave slope. Now, I wanted to talk about a few pros and cons of using high-pass filters versus, say, a shelf. So, high-pass filters will gradually remove frequencies slightly above the corner frequency, but then, of course, below the corner frequency. But by the time you get a few octaves down, the signal can be cut 20, 30, 40 dB or more. Shelves, on the other hand, will reduce frequencies to a certain dB level and then flatten out down to 20 Hz. So when you turn a shelf down by 6 dB, that's the most it will ever be cutting, really. So you have a lot more control over a shelf, over how much you're taking out. Another factor is that most of the time, high-pass filters have much more destructive phase shift than shelves do. Now, yes, if you were to take a shelf and make it so drastic that it resembled a similar shape to a high-pass filter, then sure, you would have a very drastic phase shift as well. But most of the time, we don't really do that. And you'll find that using a shelf, you don't need to cut the sound quite as much as you would be with a high-pass filter. Now, high-pass filters are very quick and very easy. They don't take up a lot of space on a microphone circuit or in a preamp, so a lot of things have them. It's a one-knob thing. It's very easy to use, and it's a little easier to remember a good starting place, whereas a shelf takes a much more complicated circuit, it might add more noise to your signal, and most of the time you're not going to find a shelf on every single piece of gear, whereas a filter is really common, even on guitar pedals, guitar amps, things like that. Now, I will say, high-pass filters are more effective at completely removing unwanted information than shelves are. For example, if you're recording flute and the only thing below 100 hertz is just room rumble and cars passing and air conditioner rumble, just high-pass it. It will be very effective at removing that. It will silence it better than using a shelf will. However, if you're trying to shape the low frequency content of a flute, I think that's much better done with a shelf because you have more control over it, you have less drastic phase shift, and you can really fine tune it exactly to where you need it. Now, another really good argument for using high-pass filters over shelves, especially for getting rid of extraneous information, is when using anything with compression. When we're trying to compress something like a vocal or a guitar or a bass, we really don't want that compressor to be triggered by anything other than relevant information. Now, of course, some compressors have built-in detector circuits where they will ignore the low end in their sidechain circuit, but not every compressor does this. So if you're recording a vocal and you've got these weird low-frequency thumps down at 20 hertz or 40 hertz, you don't want that triggering your compressor unnecessarily. So using a high-pass filter is a really effective way to make sure that will not trigger your compression. Now, arguably one of the biggest cons of high-pass filters versus shelves is that you can't really undo a high-pass filter, whereas you can undo a shelf. I get a lot of questions about recording with analog EQ, do you print with EQ, things like that, and I try not to use too many filters while recording because you can't undo them. Now, again, I feel confident using a high-pass filter if it is set to a frequency that I know is absolutely useless information. For example, if I'm recording a vocal and I have a high-pass filter set to 50 hertz, there's a good chance there's almost no 50 hertz in that vocal. Everything that I'm high-passing at that point is just rumble and noise and air conditioner and whatever. But if I'm trying to actually shape the low end of my vocal, I'm going to reach for a shelf. Because if I go too far or not far enough, I can undo that later with a plugin. Now, with a filter, electrically speaking, the frequencies that you're rolling off are gone. They go to ground, meaning you can't really get them back. So I would be very cautious of using lots of filtering on the way in. And I almost never use low-pass filters while recording either for the same exact reason. That top end is gone, and I can't really get it back later if I need more of it. So how high do I feel comfortable setting a high-pass filter, whether it's recording or mixing? Typically speaking, I use what I call the lowest note technique, which is the lowest note of whatever I am recording. That's about as high as I'm going to put my high-pass filter. 
So for example, if I'm recording electric guitar and it is tuned standard, a standard E to E tuning, the lowest note that's probably going to produce that is relevant to that guitar is around 82 hertz. Now, because a high pass filter is going to cut about 3 dB at the corner frequency, my high pass filter for that electric guitar might not be any higher than 70 hertz. And if I need to shape the low end of the guitar, then I'm going to use a shelf. Now, it's always wild to me when you see people talking about high-pass filtering electric guitars to 100 or 150 or 250 hertz to get them to fit into a mix. I think that is much better served by a shelf than a filter. And for me, I'm using the filter for kind of its original purpose, which is to filter out extraneous, unnecessary information, not actually to shape the sound. The same would be true for a vocal. If the lowest note that vocalist is singing is a low A at 110 hertz, then the lowest I'm probably going to put my high pass filter on that vocal is maybe 90 hertz, just a little bit lower than that frequency. And again, if I need to shape the low end of that vocal, I'm going to use a shelf, either from a Pultec or a Neve or some other EQ. Now, doing this technique, I find that I prefer higher slopes than if I were trying to use it more as a shaping type of filter. So I'm very often using the Neve style high pass filter, which is 18 dB per octave. So I'm setting a lower frequency, but it's a steeper slope because I want it to truly cut out the information at that frequency or below, but I don't want it to really affect my higher frequencies. I don't want it to affect the actual low end of my instrument. I'm gonna take care of that with a shelf. Now, of course, if we're talking about something more creative, something like a synth sound or something like a distorted drum room mic, and you're using the filters to create this sort of wild, drastic, effecty sound, then sure, I'm going to use wild high-pass filters and low-pass filters, probably with resonance bumps, probably much higher and lower than I might normally. But when it comes to just cleaning up naturally recorded instruments like overheads or acoustic guitar or vocals, I'm very careful with the way I use high pass filters. Now, another common question I get is do you high pass filter everything? And I would say I generally high pass most things in a mix. I almost never will high pass bass. I will sometimes high pass a kick drum, but again, I will usually do some sort of resonant slope where it's actually boosting the corner frequency. Let's say it's 50 hertz and it's high passing below that. So it's really only high passing the very lowest frequencies in that kick drum. But I can't tell you the last time I put a high pass filter on a bass guitar. And if I did, again, I would go with the lowest note technique. So if I'm using a five string bass guitar, that low B is going to be about 31 hertz. So the highest I would probably put a high pass filter would maybe be 25. And the only reason I could see doing that would be if there was some sort of strange low frequency thumping or resonance or power supply ripple of some kind that was causing this weird low frequency buildup. And the only reason I'm doing it is to prevent the energy from clouding up in that region. So to summarize, basically I only use high pass filters to clear away absolutely unnecessary information and I'm typically doing so with a steeper slope, something more like 18 dB per octave. If I wanted to use a high pass filter to actually affect the tone of my instrument, there's a good chance I'm probably going to be using a really wide mellow slope like 6 dB per octave. But in most cases, I'm just going to use a shelf to affect the tone of my instrument or of my low end. Now, I do like using resonant high pass filters for certain things like kick drum or like toms to get a little bit of a bump at that corner frequency and cut everything below it. But that's more of an effect kind of thing where that low end gets a little bit extra thump and resonance from that high pass filter. But like I said, in most cases, I'm just going to use a shelf and the high pass filter is only being used for extraneous information only. A shelf can be undone. It can be fixed later if you go too far while tracking. It has less of a weird phase shift and it's going to, in general, sound more gentle and less audible than a high pass filter will. Now, all of this being said, this is just my take on high pass filters. I personally think people try to use them for more than what they're good at. 
I think people set them way too high and they get themselves into trouble by not being able to undo it later. And instead, it's a little bit more effective to use them for only extraneous, unusable, unneeded information and use shelves for actually shaping your low frequencies, for correcting for proximity effect, and for dealing with overly boomy sounds. But I'm fully aware that there are a lot of mixers that would probably disagree with me, especially those that come from the world of analog, where on an SSL console, you have four bands and a high-pass filter and low-pass filter. And if you are already using your low band for something, you might have to use the high-pass filter to actually shape your low end because that's all you have left. But to me, in my workflow, I'm typically going to high pass a little bit at the mic preamp before any compression or anything like that. If I need to affect my low end, I'm going to use a shelf. And if I need to do more filtering later, I'm just going to use something in the box. So I hope you found this episode interesting. I hope it's given you some things to consider about using high pass filters. And many of these things can apply to low pass filters as well. But in general, I urge you to try to experiment with this rather than using a high pass filter so high to actually get into the meat of your sound and trying to use it to shape your sound. Try to set your filters a little lower, but a little steeper. Use them for extraneous information to actually filter that stuff out and then try using shelves to actually shape your low end. Let me know what you think. Do you like the results better or worse? As always, make sure to check out recordingloungepodcast.com. Right on the front page is a link to our Discord chat. Make sure to come join us there. Make sure to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash recordinglounge. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or episode idea suggestions, send me an email at recordingloungepodcast at gmail.com. If you want to become a supporter of this podcast, which really helps me offset the costs of hosting and doing the podcast, you can check out patreon.com slash recording lounge, and I'll talk to you next time. See ya.